Hello everyone, thank you for joining me. My name is Iris and I'm from Israel. I'm an Anpuku and I'm a practitioner. I'm also teaching Anpuku in Israel. I am also a somatic experiencing practitioner and many more hats I'm working in my clinic when what I call myself uh, is an emotional somatic uh, therapist. I'm doing it for almost 20 years now and I'm working with adults, youth, and children. And the main thing in my work, the main tool in my work is the abdomen work, the body work, uh, which is called the Ampuku. And I wanna uh, show you today, uh, I think it will be only the tip of an iceberg of how I integrate and why I fell in love uh, from the beginning with the Ampuku and how I found in the last few years by researching and reading uh, the connection to integrating it with modern work, neurobiology, and everything that's connected to uh, the reasons we are so into the abdomen work emotionally and physically. So I'm gonna share screen now, I'm gonna start. We have a lot to cover. And I wanna start by first thanking, thanking the amazing Sensei Kaneko. Uh, he's also, of course, one of the uh, head leaders of the AOBTA. And I can thank him for all his patience and teaching. And he's one of the most kind, humble, and professional teachers that I got the privilege to learn from, to ask questions, and to understand and get so many extra knowledge from him. So thank you, Sensei. And this lecture is totally also thanks to you. I'll go back to the beginning. And the beginning of the beginning will be this. So this is the cover of, uh, as much as I know, the original Ampuku Zukai that was written in the Edo period. And I'm going to talk with you today about the Ampuku, the mystery of the abdomen and uh, all regarding to it and why I see it this way. Here you can see some uh, drawing and pictures from the books that I translated to Hebrew. I made an Hebrew translate in 2020. And on the same year, another uh, translation came out and it was in English with Philip. I'm gonna talk about him soon. And also I know there's another one in French and in uh, Italian. It's amazing they all came in the same year with the COVID. So we all finished our uh, few years project. I believe this is what helped us. So this is the origins I used. And this is the cover of my Hebrew book. If anybody reads Hebrew, you're more than welcome to contact me about it. And here are the subjects I'm gonna go through in this uh, uh, lecture we have for today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about the history of the Ampuku, a little bit background. I'm gonna talk about embryology background, which is connected to the abdomen and the ideas that I wanna uh, emphasize today. I'm gonna to talk about the second brain, especially with the mesentery connection, tensegrity model and more. Somatic emotional diagnosis glasses is something that I use in my clinic all the time. And I wish from this lecture, you can even just get curious about using it, okay? So we're gonna to get to it in the end. And there'll be a few videos of Ampuku techniques. Some of you uh, know it, some of you don't know it. And I just want you to see a little bit of the um, hands-on work, okay? Because this is a recording um, lecture, sorry. I'm a bit excited because this uh, lecture is recorded. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to email me. You will have all my contact information in the end of the lecture. And again, thank you. Thank you, amazing sensei. We're gonna start with the kanji. Okay, anpuku. Anpuku is, uh, we can separate it into two words. The first one, an, we'll meet it also in the anma, but uh, we're gonna look at it now through the glasses of Anpuku. An is holding, considering, and investigating 
with the hands, okay, with palpitating our, with our hands, holding this hand still or applying pressure. In Anna, we have many more techniques, also in Anpuku, but this is the, uh, the translation of the word, okay? Puku is abdomen, belly, hara, stomach, everything in Japanese. And together they are making uh, the phrase abdomen, abdominal acupressure. Okay, we can also say it in English, ampuku with an M. I use anpuku because when I was uh, working on the book, I understood from my translator, which is a Japanese woman, also a therapist, and she told me there is no M in the Japanese language, and all the texts are writing it as an N. But I know um, sometimes, and especially around uh, the States and Europe, it was changed verbally to an M, so it's not wrong to say it also with an M. When I studied 20 years ago, the Ampuku, it was with an M, but since 2020, I'm using it only as an N. Okay, so it's up to you how to use it. A small quote that um, will emphasize what I also feel about the Ampuku and what Sensei Ota felt about it and the reasons it took him to writing the Ampuku Zuka. Zuka. If we do Ampuku therapy, it will smooth out the stagnation of the basic chi, producing harmony among the organs, making the flow of blood smooth, the bones and joints more flexible, the muscles less tense, the skin moist, the appetite will be good, urine and stool will come easily, the power of the chi will increase, one's memory will improve. So everything makes sense. And for me at the beginning, when I first uh, heard about this uh, quote, I didn't understand at the beginning of my days as a therapist, as an Ampuku therapist, why is he talking about the memory? And later on, when I started to understand about the second brain and about the connection, the gut brain connection, and also about how the emotional memory, memory is rooted in the Hara, then I totally understood what he talked about. The art of the Ampuku works on the whole body and it focusing with its uh, technical hands-on techniques about on the abdomen, uh, the chest, and the connection between them. It's also work, uh, working on the torso from both sides uh, with the emphasis on the hara and the connection to the chest. It can be integrated with other uh, tools you have in your clinic. It can be a standalone tool. It's very powerful and very deep in totally taking to the emotional and physical connection in the body rooted, as I believe, in almost every pathology we meet. The Ampuku developed from the Japanese Anma at the end of the 17th century by Ota Sensei, and he was a contemporary of Uichi Sugiyama. And here you have a few words about Uchi Sugiyama. Actually, you will extra, uh, you will get also the handout of this lecture. So you will have all the text I wrote here. Don't worry about remembering it. And a few words about uh, uh, Uchi Sugiyama. He was a blind acupuncturist who lived in the years 1610 to 1695. And he developed the abdomen work to a great art, okay? He considered to be a great healer thanks to the treatment he used to do and his um, sensitivity. And he developed his hands on information and diagnosis to a really high level of uh, um, um, treatment. I'm going to take you now through a short path of quotes and landmarks regarding where the Ampuku was mentioned. And it wasn't only in the Ampuku Zukai, okay? The Hara considered to be a center of vitality and a source of reflection to a general condition of the body and mind, okay? This especially became known as at the beginning as Haratori, and later on it was known as Ampuku. So we can see in the book Tale of Iga, 
It was written for almost a hundred years. You can see the years over here, 1028 to 1107. And in this book, there was a paragraph describing a woman, a healer, who treated people with the use of her toy. Okay, look how, how much time before the Edo period it was already mentioned. The Hara is the basic place of living energy. Therefore, the root of all diseases are here. So we have to know working with the Hara and diagnose it, okay? When you diagnose the disease, you have to diagnose the Hara. This is what Toro Yoshimatsu said. In the Nanjing, we can also see some references. Moving chi between the kidneys, the gate of breathing, the source origin of the triple warmer, the moving chi between the kidneys, the center focus of the hara, the origin of the pulse, that's the center of the whole body. It's all talking about the hara and also, of course, Ming Meng, uh, GV4. Uh, okay, do four. In the Edo period, it was mentioned also in a few other books. So there's the book of Fuji Sugiyama I mentioned before. He wrote a book about the anima. And in his unique style, he also described with the blind master Fuji Sugiyama, which I talked about him, of course, before, um, about many blind, uh, um, sorry, many blind therapists who began to study anma at the time, and especially the abdomen anma, which was called anpoku. Kagawa also, also mentioned in his book, Medical Advice of Lupondo, the abdomen anma, which was called anpoku, as I said. And also Fuji Bayashi wrote the anma tebiki, the manual of the anma. It was first published in 1835, but it was written in 1799, and over there, there's the unique abdomen uh, diagnosis by Sensei Ota and various Sampuku techniques that he mentioned. Okay, at the same time, Ota Sensei book, the Ampuku Zukai, was published. First published in 1827, and uh, the second one was in 1887. Okay, this book was the source of inspiration in the years of uh, the 1925 to 1989, okay, in the 20th century, when the shiatsu was developed. And both books are characterized by illustrations in order to reach as many people as possible, common people, not only the royal family, to be able to use the amazing techniques that Ota Sensei was so uh, amazed from. In this book, this is the book of Philip Vanderbilt, is also one of our uh, registered um, um, certificate, sorry, instructors in the AOPTA. And he also translated the book to English. So you're more than welcome. And I want to thank him personally for helping me uh, and um, being so generous with the drawing of the Anima Tebiki. You have a lot of information in his book about the Anma Tebiki and translation also of the Ampuku Zukai. And he's an amazing person. So I'm sure if you have any questions, I, I really feel free to say, just ask him. So thank you again, Philip. And here are drawings of the Anma Tebiki. And uh, we can see over here that in the core of the Anma Tebiki, and this is the reason I'm mentioning it now, there's a chapter about Ampuku. And it was um, described as supreme techniques, which you should apply only after you are a professional practitioner and you make deep practice and understanding of the anima. The abdomen diagnosis also appeared under the name Fukushin Hara diagnosis. The importance of the abdomen in modern Japan is also a no noticeable. And our days also you can find phrases that highlight why it's so important. And it can be found in even everyday phrases like thinking with the hara, feeling with the hara, hara gatatsu, the hara stand up. I believe it means I'm angry. And we have in English also gut feeling, keep it in the gut, uh, butterflies in my stomach. All those phrases mention how important the abdomen is, and there is, it's not uh, um, by accident, 
Okay, there is a reason behind it, and the reason is biology, and we're going to go there. Okay, soon. So here I wrote a few words about it, but I'm going to deepen into it very soon. Autosensis. So the source of disease is in the source chi, the yuan chi. The essence of the concept of and puku work is helping to uh, nourish, clean, and move this specific chi. The Ampuku work is considered rare, and there are not so many teachers also today in the world to spread this amazing work around. Very little is known about uh, Ota Sensei, the legendary Ota. He was a therapist from Osaka, and when he was around 30 years old, he became sick. His goal was to spread as much as possible the ampuku among the common people after he understood the quality of the work recovering from it. So initially he printed uh, 30 units and spread it around. They were very unique in a very unique uh, uh, binding technique um, like they used to do books in the Edo period. And it was considered a work of art, as I said, because of the uh, people that gathered together to collect the information, to draw the information, and you have over you all the names. And now I want to take you into the ideas of the mystery of the Hara. So we're going to go into the beginning of the beginning to understand why I call it the mystery of the Hara and why I think all the ideas behind the Ampuku are so, so strong. So we have to start with the beginning of the beginning. We'll go to embryology. Here we can see the first three layers that when we are forming as a fetus, those are the first three layers that we can call structural spaces. And especially, I want to uh, highlight the mesoderm. Okay. So Formation of a structure partly and the most elementary level is the cavities. And I'm mentioning it because a lot of information go through the cavities and the spaces, spaces between the cells, between the uh, frames, okay? They are an integral part, and I totally believe they are an integral part of the structures. And like any other organ, they have high importance and a great role. Okay, in the body. It's like we think about there is no shadow without the light and there is no light without a shadow. I feel it's the same thing and both of them have a lot of importance. In and young, basic. In the initial division of embryology development, we will find the first three layers. So it will be the endoderm, this will be the outer layer the ectoderm, the inner layer, and there's the mesoderm in the middle. But I want to take you to one of the uh, uh, most amazing professors. I heard his lectures, Dr. Jap van der Waal, and he's talking about what the embryo has to say about togetherness. And the connection to the mesoderm is because the mesoderm is in the middle, and it's not exactly a layer. He calls it only meso. Why? Because it's a space. It's a special, a very unique space, which all the beginning of formation of life and all organs. And um, um, you'll see in a second what's, what formates in the mesoderm start over there. So it's not a derm. Okay. It's related because uh, it's a space. We use it as, he calls it, as a meso. It is an inner and delicate tissue between two other layers of the, this amazing first matrix that develop into the organism, which uh, relevant into movement and process in the third week of creation. So in the four, sorry, in the third week of formation, we can see how this special mesoderm is forming. And this is the place that our core of being develop. Core of being our first inner self, our first compost is creating. 
this core of inner world, the core of the self, all starts in the mesoderm, okay? It's a different space. And we can see also that um, central systems like blood, fascia, and the mesentery, which I will highlight soon, developed in the mesoderm, okay? In this space, all the systems that enable movement, which means enables life develop, okay? So just as the chi enables movement, so does the blood, the heart, the muscle, and the fascia. And also, uh, from what I understood, the main axis, the kidney heart axis, according to Chinese medicine, develops in the mesoderm. So this is a very unique space, okay? Let's see now what also very uniquely starts in the mesoderm. And this is the first primitive line uh, paving the way to the brain-gut connection, which is very important to us if we are talking about Ampuku and the connection with um, the emotion and the um, brain, okay? So the first primitive line becomes the spinal cord and the brain starting his way in the ectoderm region. Important life support functions depend on development of the primitive line. It moves to the inner middle area around fourth week. And so it means it moves to the mesoderm, okay? Out of the surfing movement, which we'll understand soon what makes this uh, idea and who controls this surfing uh, um, movement, the cells uh, uh, began the primitive line. It designs like a tube, faces, and this is the first orientation in the body. It's facing up sky and earth at both ends, okay? It becomes a tube. This step occurs as part of the initial orientation inside the womb. And from here, it's developed progressing further on. Who's making this amazing surfing, okay? This tube collects sensory information. And this tube collects it, and all actually uh, uh -huh, information is collected with the nervous system. It all starts with the existence of this common nervous tissue from which the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic and the enteric nervous system develops. These unique cells are called neurocrusts, okay? And those neurocrusts are located in the brain and in the gut, and they make this first orientation and they make this tube. So we know now, that the beginning of the connection between the brain and the gut starts with those neural crust. And this is biology, okay? The word in Greek language means brain tissue. So this tissue is the direct connection to the subject, the second brain. And here is a recommendation for you guys, the second brain book. I'll go through the lecture with a few more recommendations. So in this um, idea of the second brain, which actually I believe the enteric nervous system is the first brain, but this um, book will take you into got, getting more information regarding it physically. The knowledge from the gut and the heart is shown in the cells themselves. We can see it only from formation like this, okay? Already in this initial stages of our lives, so, so early in our lives. Communication between the second brain and the primitive brain starts. The enteric nervous system is um, a very unique nervous system, which is located in our colon. Um, we have to say this tissue is very important, okay? And they have the same source as other uh, nervous system, as I said before. This tissue is important because it affects a lot of conditions, uh, immune system, and uh, for example, the serotonin, the quality of serotonin, 80% of it is produced in the uh, intestines. Can you imagine? Not in the brain, in the intestine, okay? 
So uh, another recommended book will be uh, The Spark in the Machine of Dr. Daniel Kian, which is an MD and uh, Chinese medicine practitioner. And he's uh, uh, describing how those neurocrusts move and migrate between several places. This is the way they work, okay? They have a job over here, they do it, then they move to another place. And let's go through a few um, roles they are um, part of their job. They create the cells that produce adrenaline in the kidneys, the adrenal glands, relate to the producing of teeth, produce the cartilage in the body, the parathyroid glands, and uh, the cells that support the producing of the brain, the nervous system, and more, okay? Some, of, some scientists call them the fourth layer, okay? The fourth extra on the ectoderm, endoderm, and the mesoderm. Another book of Dr. Kian, The Uncharted Body, he describes the beginning of the surfing and how they start their life moving from the ectoderm to the center, okay? While they were forming the neural tube, the, the one that I was talking about before, the primitive line, they go to the midline and it means that they move to the mesoderm. From there, they migrate further on to their next job, okay? This is a very unique uh, job in the body and they are very unique. Now, it's all connected as you remember in the quote from Ota talking about memory. So I wanna take you a little bit into the somatic memory and how memories are being formed in the body, okay? So components of uh, memory made by not only cognition, and I think even more not the cognition rules in this part, but the body sensations, the movement, the senses, Memory can appear also in emotion and sensory way and can be hidden keys for healing, okay? We know, especially when children are uh, get, coming to our clinic when they are grown up, sometimes they don't remember cognitive memories, uh, maybe because there was a very shocking trauma or maybe because it was very early and this is part of the defense system or part of the way we are being created until the age of three years old. Most of our memories are mostly somatic. So we have the memory, but it's coding in the body itself, not in the frontal neocortex. Okay, so we can work with those body sensations, with the movement, with those senses to heal, okay, this part called bottom-up work, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it soon. Prenatal psychologist mentions also a certain awareness that comes through the blood flow, through the veins, through the vestibular wiring, and develop in the fetus in the very first two weeks of its formation, okay, and those are prenatal psychologists talking about it. This is the way of the development of a person compost. So it's very important to us to understand when we are looking for uh, um, guiding um, and also understanding how these things work, we can also um, uh, emphasize and psychoeducate our clients to understand why the gut work and also the body work in general is important for us, okay? So uh, patterns of behavior start already in this age in a very, very young formation uh, uh, part that is already in the wound, okay? The good news is that sometimes we will meet the adults and they don't know what to do about it, but we can take them through the bottom-up work. And if they have also uh, the option to go to a top-down work, which they combine together if needed, they have a whole uh, a supporting um, environment regarding healing from what they complain about, okay? So I'm gonna take a short break now, and we're gonna continue after we understood the good news with 
uh, what is felt sense and how it's printed in the body. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and we'll come back for our second part. Okay, so before the break, we talked about uh, the history of Ampuku, understand a little bit about the embryological background and why, but from the biological point of view, the hara, the abdomen is so important and its connection to the brain. We moved on to talking about memories and how they format only uh, from the somatic point of view and not from the cognitive point of view of it. And we talked about the connection to sensations, to senses, to uh, feelings, and how it's all rooted and coded in the body. So I'm going to continue from this point now and share screen again. And here I want to share with you some information about the felt sense. The felt sense, this is uh, the way we collect and we translate to ourselves how we feel about things, okay? How we feel about things regarding how the body coded it and uh, uh, explain it to himself. There is a lot of explanations around it, and there are a lot of theories which we, we won't have time to go into today. But I'm just going to say, um, if you're interested and curious about, about it, again, you're more than welcome to write me, and I will give you uh, information about how, from what I know, to uh, deepen into those uh, subjects, okay? So, felt sense, the inner power of resonance. We have in our cleaning, in our clinic, when we work with clients, the need for resonance, understanding from a, a, a clean point of view, the core resonance in the, uh, the room, okay? And by it, we can help co-regulate and regulate self-regulation. So the senses of feeling, it's not a spiritual experience, it's a physical experience. This is something that uh, Gandalin said, okay, the developer of focusing. Bodily awareness of the situation and personal events. An inner error that surrounds everything, give it to you all at once, okay? We have a full uh, experiment and a full feeling about um, things that we go through in life, okay? Events we go through in life. I'm sorry, my English is so stuck today. I'm so excited to do this lecture, so please excuse me. Instead of details by details, okay? Peter Levine is also talking about it and gives a very nice metaphor regarding music and the felt sense, because when we listen to an orchestra, it, um, we don't listen to two and on separately. We listen to the, and get the whole feeling, the whole atmosphere, okay? And he says, the felt sense unites data and gives them together the meaning. Like listening to music that we love, that made from signal sounds combined to a big and hopeful experience. So this is how we collect information and translate it to ourselves, okay? And we can talk about neuroception and interception without mentioning the amazing Stephen Porges, Dr. Stephen Porges, which developed and researched for many years the groundbreaking polyvagal theory uh, regarding the vagus nerve, and all its connection to emotional and especially trauma therapy is well known in the field. I, If you don't know the theory, I think it's the first thing you need to do and you're curious about it, of course, after this lecture, just start to read about it, look around for it because the vagus nerve has a lot of importance in healing and has a big role in the felt sense game. Okay, the vagus nerve, uh, uh, just a few words about it. it, has two branches, the ventral one and the dorsal one, and both of them play a big role in how we act and survive and um, make decisions about interactions in life, okay? Uh, it's affected from many things, but um, we can totally help healing from it, and the vagus is the cranial, the 10th cranial nerve. 
Another book I want to recommend you is the book of uh, Stanley Rosenberg, uh, because we are all talking about body work and manual work. Stanley Rosenberg is talking about some techniques, uh, healing techniques that we can use for self-help and also uh, uh, teach our clients self-regulation by um, self-touch and movement, okay? Regarding the vagus nerve. Now I want to talk about my second great love connected to the first love of the mesentery and the heart of the core idea behind it, which I feel is so strongly rooted in all the biology that I spoke about in the first part of the lecture. So let's see if you will feel the same and I'll be more than happy to hear from you about it. Look how beautifully this area is okay in the body. The mesentery is the root of the abdomen. It's a unique connective tissue due to its very significant location. It is in the core of the body. It allows communication between the abdomen wall and the internal abdomen organs. This has a lot of meaning on both physical and neuroceptical level, okay? Here we can see um, drawings of Leonardo da Vinci 500 years ago of this amazing connective tissue. But, you know, only in 2016, this tissue was declared as an organ in modern medicine, okay? As part of this connective tissue, the fascia, which develops in the mesoderm, this unique mesentery is being formed. So the root of the root is formed in the mesoderm also, okay? And it's called mesentery. It was and still researched since it was declared as an organ and um, especially Dr. Calvin Coffey, which I will talk about him soon mentions it a lot. It's a double layer. Here you can see the mesentery in this uh, uh, embryological uh, drawing. You see it's like a small one. This is the mesentery root and it's like this. It's wrapping the organs, okay? There is a double layer of the peritoneum, the membrane that wraps the abdomen organs. From the outside, the inner side is connected to the intestines and the other side is connected to abdomen wall, okay? The posterior connection to the abdomen wall is just in front of the spine. It's so deep and connected to both ways. I mean, it impacts everything in the middle of our body, in the middle of our torso. Okay. And it's very important for us to know it when we're working with the abdomen and understanding how the nervous system is connected to it. Okay. Why? Because all the signs and signal, signals from the intestine are translated within the mesentery due to its beginning between body parts and the way it goes through the intestines. It is the one that transmits the various signals to the rest of the body, not only between the abdomen organs, okay? And uh, if we didn't have it, our entire intestine, as long as they are, would be fully attached to the abdomen wall instead of breathing and moving, okay? The expansion and contraction, which is the pulse of life, is uh, being uh, able to, to thanks to the mesentery, okay? The importance of this movement for development is known to us, uh, internal and external development, okay? Also the communication from the inside out and observation of the world from the out inside is rooted with it. Professor Kevin Coffey, I mentioned him before, is a surgeon and he specializes in, in testicle disease, he said that he's working mainly on the mesentery since he understood how important it is, important as the root in for 40 uh, known diseases, okay? According to him, he's the first one to uh, form it as an embryo, okay? 
from, and from it, the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, the digestive organs, and all the rest aspects develop within it. Okay, so it's like the wound. This is why I feel it's the root of the root. Okay, it's the core, the heart of the core. Okay, the vagus nerve, which I mentioned before, goes through it. Okay. He sends an extension to it. There's a branch connected to it. And from this understanding, we can totally see that the interception and neuroception, okay, gathering the information, which we call gut feeling, connected to the uh, vagus nerve and to the mesentery. And also, very nice information, the microbiome, a lot of talking about the microbiome systems, is also very ancient, and it's also connected to the wall of the intestinal nervous system, the enteric nervous system, and it means it's connected to the mesentery. So, of course, again, it's all connected and rooted in the heart of the core, okay? And there's another thing I'm thinking about, and I'm really curious to see if you will agree with me or not. It's just a thought. I was thinking about the mesentery as the core of the Chiang Mai. We know the Chiang Mai is also at the beginning of the beginning, like the one from it created, the two from it created, the three, and we know the all things, the 10,000 things. So I feel like the mesentery maybe is, the, especially the root of the mesentery, is the core of the Chiang Mai. I don't know. Think about it. Let's give some highlights for a second, okay? It's a lot of material, and I hope you're not too overwhelmed, but thanks to the AOBTA, you're going to have it recorded, and you can watch it again and again and um, grasp the ideas I'm trying to uh, give you. The abdomen represents a complete set of digestive in several layers. Everything built at the very beginning of our lives is the time of formation. We talked about th third week of formation and fourth week of formation, about the first neural tube. And the beginning of the connection between the brain and the gut starts with the neural crust, which we understand from the beginning of those weeks in formation. Okay? The goal in healing is uh, and getting back to an ongoing homeostasis. Between these parts of the body, we are into going into homeostasis the whole time, okay? And this idea is sitting in the basic root of healing and self-regulating. And we can and we should explain to our clients that are sometimes are overwhelmed from their processes and from their um, dealing with many pathologies, emotional and physical, that our body is with us. It's not against us. And it's only going um, into uh, the idea of, I want to go back to homeostasis. And this is what drives it, okay? From this idea, I want to take you into the tensegrity model. You can see its picture over here, okay? Why I'm doing it? To emphasize the idea of holism, to emphasize the idea of going back to homeostasis, and to understand, again, that when we work with the body, we work with the whole body, and we impact all layers of bodily, physical parts, spaces which is part of it you can see over here in the model the spaces and emotions which are connected to it okay so working with touch breathing and movement works directly on the sensor and systems connected to it that can stimulate the body natural ability to heal himself okay you remember what i said before about um wanting only to go back to homeostasis, this is the way we do it, with our work, okay? with, our, with our bottom up work. We will do this by uncoupling the stagnation and defense mechanism that were stuck together because of, let's say, bugs in uh, the world of life, 
okay stones in the road of life sometimes there are rocks sometimes there are walls and they make like stagnations and uh, make the um the errors that are uh the subjects of coming to the clinic those stagnations prevent the flexibility of the structure okay and we are working on going back to flexibility and breathing movement okay movement and touch will help with the overcoupling which functions like a loop okay between structures and patterns both physical and emotional so let me give you an example for an emotional and physical glue. Uh, for example, here in Israel, I can't avoid uh, giving this um, example. If there's um, a terror attack and somebody is sitting in a coffee place, drinking coffee and eating a croissant, everything is cool. And then there's a big boom. He's okay. He's alive. He's not so okay, but he's alive. But let's say after going out of the shop, he thinks everything is okay. And then he goes in the street, smells a croissant, and immediately starts to feel an anxiety attack. Okay? That's an overcoupling because when the body recognized the smell of the croissant, he now translated it into danger. Okay? The amygdala in the brain translated it into danger. In the process, we need to separate to uncouple the overcoupling that became um, a signal to danger idea because the coruscant is not dangerous coruscant is very tasty okay so this is just a small example now when we are talking about understanding and looking through the glasses of the emotional uh, uh, point of view and the somatic emotional point of view we need to look, look on, on diagnostic um, tools with um, another extra tool, which is what's the story behind it? What's the narrative connected to the biology we meet from the emotional angle? The human mind and the rest of the body form an indiv indivisible organism. United by interactive biochemical and neural circuits, which include endocrine, immune, and nervous autonomic components. Okay, Antonio de Maggio said it when he spoke about the psycho neuro endoimmune system, which is human beings, the body, and healing from it. Another way to say it will come from uh, Dr. Edward Neal which talking uh, about, uh, of course, uh, uh, Chinese medicine. And he said it's all about patterns of breathing, motion, time, and space, which uh, affect the um, fabric of life, okay? Life is a temporary event that emerged from universal patterns of change and transformation, okay? Um, Dr. Edward Neal, I also highly recommend his classes, his lectures. He also has free ones, and he has a full uh, um, aging medicine studies. So we go back now to understanding what's the connection to the consecrity model, right? So tensegrity, the meaning is tension and integrity. It's a model developed from architecture, okay, in the 60s, in the 20, 20th, uh, 20th century in, in the 60s. A structural principle based on the use of individual components that are in continuous compression within a network of connection tension. Look, this picture of those uh, spider nets, it's, uh, a very good example to a tensegrity model. And the structure stability is created as a result of tensile forces. Unlike stone stuff, uh, uh, structures which are based on comp compression forces, okay? So the, our body and the way the system works, and this is how we can work on one part and impact another part, not only physically, also emotionally. Okay, here we can see the tensegrity model again, and we can compare it to uh, fascia in the body. Okay, so the fascia 
is like those paces between the sticks and the rubbers. In the Suen, chapter 8, we can understand another angle of the spaces by talking about the triple warmer and the Xiaoyang. Office of Religion Design, the water pathways issues from it. This is the office for designing the irrigation in the body. The water courses come out of it, okay? The triple warmer, okay? And uh, that is the layer connected to the fascia system and the lymphatic system pathways. And they are all created again in this amazing and special space called mesoderm. So in the bottom up approach, as I mentioned before, we can maximize healing and movement with the help of understanding the different structures of the body. In particular, the abdomen area, thanks to the second brain and the ability for neuroplasticity is very meaningful. So when we're working on the abdomen, we are helping neuroplasticity. So that means we can change patterns also in the brain, patterns of thinking, of behaving. And of course, we need sometimes to, as I said before, mm -hmm. uh, combine it with a top-down cognitive talk therapy, okay? The guiding line is the constant natural goal to return to homeostasis. And we need to remember and remind our clients this part. Knowing the guidelines of the body and the movement within them is a gateway to somatic recovery, recovery from the root, even in situations of epigenetic stagnations, things that happened in the wound, okay? With a somatic emotional diagnosis glasses, we can ask ourselves a few questions that we can add to the way we check at the beginning and every week we meet our client. How was your week? So we need to look at where in the tissue the story located. Okay, we, this is also connected to mapping, uh, bodily mapping and diagnosing with body mapping. What is the weather? I use it a lot with kids. What's the weather today? How do you feel? Where did the movement and breathing got stuck? Not only a physical breathing, but totally where the body is stiff. Okay, sometimes the whole body is stiff. Sometimes the whole body is not breathing and you can see this person is not alive. It's alive, but it's not, it's like a dead man walking in life, okay? How we will we handle the biology of narrative and the patterns? This is our part, handling the biology of the narrative. Okay. So I gave uh, um, there is the um, the whole abdomen um, uh, diagnosis of Otosense is very unique. It's very uh, early before the Shiatsu um, diagnosis. And in general, it's talking about um, checking the pulse, the temperature, the moisture, the elasticity. And there's another part talking about kinds of lumps, okay? So I wanna take this specific example of lumps and show you how I ask myself uh, when I combine it with biological knowledge and how do I treat it, okay? So let's go to types of lumps. We have water, we have food, we have chi, and we have blood, okay? There's also abdomen tension and the armor. The armor is a theory based in a physical psychology by William Reich, but when we look at it and we look at the patterns and how it's seated in the body, we can totally, totally uh, uh, parallel it to um, Ota lamp, okay? Kind of lamps. So. Um, when we look at the lamps, we are asking ourselves, why did the body choose in a certain place to do those specific uh, lamps and why the stiffness is over there, okay? Is it very deep? Is it uh, deep and because it's rooted in a very early age or it's deep because it was a shock trauma which was rushing in? and cutting uh, in a very uh, uh, fast and undigestible way. 
So this is part of the options that we can look at um, those kinds of lamps, okay, when we take it into the knowledge, which is the biology knowledge, okay? Is it densifications, like scars? Is it uh, um, um, fibrosis? Is it uh, densifications? It means like um, the fascia is glued to it, one another, okay? Is it, is it a fibrosa like cutting from surgery and why and how it impacts other areas, okay? How it affects the whole fabric of life. Very important to look through those glasses, okay? Now, I want to take you back to the Ampuku, okay? And let's look at it from the Ampuku point of view and those glasses of the emotional. So I'm going to show you a few videos and we're going to walk through it. Small disclaimer, well, of course, this is only a demo. And uh, if you want to be an therapist, you need to go through a full class, full course, frontal teaching, whenever and wherever you choose to do it. We're going to start with two techniques from the Anmatebiki. Of course, they are on the abdomen. And we can see how we are working. The first one will be the shelves in Hebrew. I'm so sorry, I didn't translate it to English, this one. But uh, anyway, I'm talking, so it doesn't matter. So the first one will be uh, the showman. And this one is moving the uh, rib cage, especially at the area of the diaphragm. There's a whole system of thinking about the connection between diaphragms in the body. And working with the respiratory diaphragm is very important, especially when we're working with Ampuku. We connect, we help to connect this major uh, bridge between the chest and the abdomen. It is highly important okay, for many, many functions, emotional and physical. And sometimes we can see it's very stiff. And think about moving it, opening this gate, very gently from side to side. And in the end, we press lever 13, okay? We help regulate with lever 13. So think about it from the glasses I was talking about before, in the middle of the body, the armor, the second skin, okay? opening the connection of the information between the axis of the heart-kidney connection, okay? Sometimes I do some extra uh, modifications and I'm adding um, um, pressing on spring 12. And then I can also work um, because there is a connection, fascial connection between all the diaphragms in the body. Working and pressing spring 12 also connect, opening the pelvic uh, um, fascia. Okay. Pelvic uh, diaphragm. Sorry. Second one I'm going to show you is the cocky. It's um, there are a few kind of cockies. This one is from the Anmatabiki. There's another cocky I uh, was um, I learned from uh, Kano Kaneko Sensei, but it's for another class. This cocky is talking about uh, making the connection. Okay, making the connection between uh, renate okay, and the spirit. So we are soothing with our hands and connecting from stomach 19 to the edge of um, renate. So the other one will be uh, Bonoku. Bonoku is a classical here. You can see the drawings on the side, drawings from um, the Ampoku Zukai. And here is another uh, example of connecting between diaphragms and between the chest and the abdomen, okay, opening stagnations. And as uh, Kaneko Sensei told me once, cleaning the toxic water under the heart. It's a beautiful technique. You can see how we work on the CV and on the under the rib cage, okay, and again pressing the liver 13. Liver 13 is a big star. Also, here 
sometimes I do modifications and um, do another press or instead of lever 13, I do uh, pressing on stomach 30 or spin 12, depends what I wanna do. And with pregnant women, we can do it without pressing on lever 13. Okay, we can do it in uh, many uh, um, ways, and um, this is a very nice one. Love it. Okay. Joey, now we're going to see Joey. Joey is walking directly on uh, this, the stomach, affecting also the spleen. So we are working on, a, uh, on the earth element again against the rib cage. Not all techniques are uh, in the immediate zone of the rib cage, but look how important it is. So working like a pump, pump from outside and pump inside. The hand on the rib cage is very deep and going out only 30%, not totally out. And this is how we pump life into the organ. Okay? If you want to try it at home, try it once with the hand. Uh, the outer hand, and one the second time without it, you will see it's totally different. Feeling. And the impact on the client. Nice. Rishui. Again, cleaning the toxic water under the heart, helping urinating. And here you will see an example of how I work with pregnant women with the issue. And uh, usually it's done in the direction only uh, top down, uh, ignoring the direction of the channel kidney, it's working on the stomach, the kidney, and the CV. Here you're going to see I'm going to work on the stomach with its direction, original direction. On the kidney, and I spoke with uh, Kaneko Sensei about it. He said there is no objection to do it, but uh, the idea of the uh, original text is going only from top to down. But uh, when I'm working with pregnant women, I'm working with the kidneys uh, directions going up and only then doing the suiting on the CV, okay, on the leg, like this, okay, slowly, slowly. Of course, when the, the, the uh, belly of a pregnant woman is bigger, we work with it gently in the way we can. There's a whole chapter of uh, uh, abdominal work for pregnant women, of course. This technique is very good for the lumps I mentioned before. For all kinds of stimulations. And that's it. Wow, we got to the end. Okay, let me stop sharing for a second. So, it's a lot. And I gave you only highlights. And I know it was really fast. But you can, again, listen again and again. You can write me and you can ask me anything. I hope I will be able to answer or direct you. And I'll give you, oh, I need to give you also my contact viewing once again. So here we have it. Okay. Here are my contact details. Mm -hmm. This is my website, my Facebook, and my personal email. You are more than welcome to address me in person. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you got curious about those amazing ideas. I have tons of book and articles regarding those ideas and I all the time find more. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you will also dive in with me and get curious about it. And I hope you understand a little bit about how amazing the Ampuku method it is okay thank you so much for listening and hope to see you again bye-bye for now